Uh, all right, so let's get started. Uh, my name's Steve. That's where you can find me. That's a zero on the end because I'm elite like that. Um, I work at Crunchy Data. We're Postgres people. The talk today, uh, I did a little bait and switch, but I figured this audience would be the most forgiving of, oh my gosh, I said I was going to talk about this. I started putting the talk together. I'm really not happy with that, but I can stay somewhat close to it, but it needs a better title. Is that okay? Is, can I get forgiveness on that from this audience? Yeah, yeah okay, because I thought everybody would have, because you know you have to do the, eh, whatever. All right, moving on. So the main point, the whole talk, is we keep talking about metrics, and I don't even think we have a decent model for why we're collecting metrics or what we're going to do with them, okay? I've been at this about 15 years now, developer relations, and we'll get to the main point of that at the end. Uh, let's get right to it. What are these? Tools. Nice job. What's a tool? Tools are things that something that helps you solve, that helps you in a particular activity. Um, I didn't have, I'm cheap, so I didn't pay for the expensive British University, I guess, the OED dictionary, right? Instead, I figured I got the Cambridge one. That must be the lesser one down the street. Any Brits? Is there really a difference between Oxford and Cambridge in terms? Yeah. Did you go to Oxford? Yeah, I thought so. Is that, like a, is that like a Harvard versus Yale thing? Nice. Is someone in the back like giving him a finger that went to Cambridge? Is that what's going on over there? Um, so I got, that's the Cambridge Dictionary, right? I figured that would be good because it was at least from the right continent. Um, so what is that? It's a word, but what's a word? It's also a tool, right? Words are actually tools because I put some lines on the screen and every single one of you in here now has a mental picture of some dog, right? I didn't have to show you my two beautiful dogs, right? I know, <laughs> exactly, my girls. Um, but uh, I put that up there to say, look, tool, a word is a tool because I could put up squiggly lines on a page or say the word dogs to you and you immediately get the picture of what we're communicating about, right? And some, it's a particular type of tool that also fits in with this. A map and the equation for an align. What kind of tools are these? All three of them. They're models, right? They're representations that aren't the actual thing but helps us get our work done when we're talking about stuff. So models are a type of tool. Not all, all models are tools, not all tools are models, okay? And then what I'm gonna get to with this is a peculiar dilemma about models that we are afflicted by as humans. Fact, our brains are constantly making and using models. There is all the time, even while you're listening to me speak, you're making models. When you walked over here this morning, you had models processing through your brain of all the people in front of you, right? Where are they moving? I don't want to collide with that person. You're not consciously thinking of the model, but your brain is churning through models, right? All the time. Have you ever seen that? Um, actually, reality is too much for us. Has everybody seen those videos about how we actually filter reality? Even what we think is reality is actually a model of reality that our brain can comprehend. You've seen that video where like, they're like, did you see the gorilla go come through the room? Someone's giving a speech, you're watching the speech. You didn't see the gorilla, then they show you the rewind of the video and there was a gorilla in the room. Like it was actually really a person in a gorilla suit. But still, or there was a banana on the wall that the gorilla ate. But still, um, that was a model that we used that didn't allow us to perceive that gorilla in the room because we were busy fo focusing on the talk. We actually filtered reality that, so that our brain could comprehend it. So that gets us to, and this is George Box is a British statistician, and he says all models are wrong, but some are useful. All right, so here is the dilemma. We're always making models, and all the models we make are by definition wrong. A map is wrong, right? There are some parts of it that are useful. You've simplified the world, to make it so that certain things are not true, but other things that were useful to you are true on the map. So your models are always wrong. Kind of like there was no gorilla in the room and there was a gorilla in the room. <clears throat> models also constrain your worldview, right? And so this is, if we go back to language as an example, uh, did, how many people, well, I'll say it this way. Did you know, more cocktail party trivia coming throughout the rest of the talk, but did you know that the ancient Greeks had no word for blue. The word blue did not exist in their language. So if you asked them what the sky looked like, 
there was no, they, there was no color to sky. Right? It was just sky. Russians, in their native language, have two words for blue. And because of that, they actually can perceive differences in blue shades faster than non-Russian speakers. If you want to hear the whole thing on that, that was on a Radio Lab podcast, okay, where they talk about words and perception and functioning of the mind. So there's the constraint are usual, at least for me, growing up as a Gen Xer, constraints are bad. Right? How dare you constrain me? But actually, it turns out that some, in some ways, constraints are good in that they allow us to do things maybe faster or communicate things better. Like if we had no constraints in language, how well would that work? It wouldn't, right? Part of what makes language work is that we constrain what we're going to talk about and what words mean so that we can share communication. But so we get all models are wrong, and models constrain how we think about the world. What's a model that we use a lot in developer relations? Personas. We just saw one before with Isha, the persona, right, of the user. That's a definite model. Does that person actually exist that she put up on the screen? That's not a hard question. <laughs> it's really not. I know you got and I know you can turn it on for I know you're all introverts, you can turn it on for a second, right? Turn it on for a second and just answer the question, did that person really exist? Or do when we do personas, is the person usually some exact person? Do they usually exist? No. no. It's a model of who that type of programmer or developer is, right? And so by definition, is that model correct? No. When you say a Java developer, then you've got some model in your head, but then you go to interview a, a, a Java developer like Baruch, and some parts of it are correct, and some parts of it are not. But that model was useful, but it also constrains what we think that person can do. So you say, okay, fine, models suck, I'm going to opt out. Right, that's it. But you can't. Right? In the famous, I wore the belt in honor. If you can't see it, this goes out to all the Canadians in the audience as well. Okay? You want me to sing it? I sang last year at this talk at this conference. You want me to sing it again? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. Ba bomb bum. All right? That's free. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's free will by Rush. Right? And here they're talking about free will. But here I'm talking about models. You can't choose not to make a model. All that you've chosen by not making a model is that you're going to use a crappy model, right? Or you're just going to use some default model. So you don't have to make personas. But then what that means is you're just going to treat your, your developers as a, an unwashed mass. And that is not really good either. So you say, thanks a lot, Steve. I can't opt out, no matter what I'm making models. So what's your point? So my point is, I would like us as a profession to bring attention and intention to the models that we choose. We're always going to be making models. Let's actually get better about picking our models and be intentional about which model we're using in which situation. So let's look at one of the models that we use a lot. And this is probably the most common model we've talked about today in DevRel. What's that? Uh, apologies to Phil. I know that someone put in the ARP into there. That doesn't require the ARP stuff in the diagram. But what kind of model is that? No, funnel, exactly. It's a funnel model. It's probably the most common one that we talk about. We borrowed it, right, from social media, like social media SEO stuff. And I think it actually is not a great model for what we do. I think some parts of it are nice. It gets us to think about transitions between different states. But the problem is it constrains our view to be a linear flow for developers, right? Remember how I said models constrain? When you think about a funnel model, it imposes on that view. The developer starts with seeing you at a show. From there, she moves on to trying out your API. From there, she builds a demo app. From there, she, and that's the only way you can conceive of how your activities fit together. Right? And I think that actually imposes a false narrative on the way that we actually interact with a lot of our developers and how they become our customers, or whatever you want to call it. The other problem with a funnel model is, it's very hard to, it's almost, it's actually not quantitative. You can't parameterize it, making it very actually hard to test your hypotheses in it. There's no hypotheses testing in it, as far as I can tell. So let me tell you a little story. In a former life, I was an ecologist. Uh, for my dissertation work, I studied this beautiful animal. This is Hemolopistis rearmori. Um, it is found in the Negev deserts and the, ne and the deserts of Asia. Uh, what, does anybody know what, what do you call it in England? 
Close, okay, good. It's not exactly a bug, it's not an insect. I would imagine some of you call it like a sow bug. Has anybody heard of a sow bug in England? Pill bug? Okay, right? Uh, Roly poly? Wood lice? Yes, wood lice. Which, which, having had kids, anytime you say the word lice, like immediate hard cancel, okay? Um, but the thing I want to talk, you want to, oh, you want more cocktail party trivia? So do you want to know how to say this in Hebrew? Okay, so Uri is a boy's name or a man's name. Kador is ball, so they're called Uri Kaduri. Just to let you know. All right, so I was interested in this organism for a whole bunch of reasons in the desert of Israel, but I'm telling you, you go up to somebody at a cocktail party like, hey, do you want to know how to say wood lice in Hebrew? <laughs> Instant in. Um, I was studying, I was studying, yeah, hitting lice and, oh uh, yeah, all, the, all together. Um, I was studying this as part of my dissertation, and they live in family groups. This individual here, this is where you go, oh, that's so cute. Um, this is the parent, one of the parents. There's actually a burrow inside of here, and these are all the offspring, and this is all their feces that they pile up around their burrow, right? Okay, calm down about feces. We're all adults here, and it's just little pieces of mud, all right? Mary's like, I got to go. Triggered, triggered. Um, so they all live like this, and the question, they have a lot of really interesting characteristics for ecological study. The one that I was um, interested in is what influences where they make their burrows, right? They basically... They're born, they, f they form a pair, they find a burrow, well actually they fi one finds a, bur a burrow, they make a pair, they have babies, they live there for the year, the parents die in August, and then everybody leaves the next year. And I was like, well what makes them pick where they want to make their burrows? So I said, okay, let's go ahead and use our funnel model to, dis to figure out what they're doing. So how would we do this using the funnel model? I just want to show how this model can constrain things. So you find a lot of individual isopods, you follow them around a bit, you watch them die or form a burrow. You then follow that burrow until everybody leaves. All along, you send them net promoter surveys, <laughs> right? How are you feeling about this burrow location? Is this, would you recommend this burrow location to other isopods, right? Are you happy with your burrow location, right? All that kind of stuff. So that actually doesn't work very well. So here's how we actually solved it. And I'm putting up an equation, so for mathophobes, just breathe, okay? I, we're not going to actually get very, diff it's just addition is all we're going to do here. And I'm going to say the probability of settling is equal to the some number times the amount of shrubs plus some number towards the amount of rocks plus error due to my measurement plus error due to stuff I didn't think about that's unexplained, all right? So what's the... The normal way, does everybody rec recognize that as a regression? Anybody who took basic stats, that should just look like a regression model to you, right? This is basic regression. The way I actually estimated it is way more than basic regression, but I'm making it really easy here. But the point of how I would say this in real life is the probability that a bur an, an isopod sex selects a part on the ground is some linear relationship between the amount of rocks there, the amount of shrubs there, and then there's some error that's messing up my estimate of the probability. Okay? And that's, how you, that's basically what that's saying. The fun parts here are, there's a whole, whole field called statistics that has spent a lot of time how to estimate these numbers. Why is that important? Because I can say, well, if I increase the amount of shrubs, I expect to see this much more probability of settling. Right? As opposed to, this is the transition from this state to this state. 10% are making it from our blog post to our sign up. I can actually estimate stuff, and I'll go into this in a bit, on this. Second, it is explicit that there is error. This helps us to avoid the very common, which we are not immune to, I put numbers into a computer and a number came out. It is truth, right? There is actually, that is what most people, like have you had that with any of your family or friends where you put something in a spreadsheet, a number comes out, like oh that's actually obviously the truth. We believe that number, it came out of a computer, right? So it helps get us get away from that. And finally, it's a, way, it's a way to conceptualize what's actually happening out there. No, not finally. The final thing is, I don't actually have to follow any individuals around. And this is what's important for us. I didn't do any following of individuals to estimate this equation. I looked at who was settling where, what was the characteristics of that was in that place, and then I estimated the model. 
So back to our problem, what does this look like for us? What's our main goal? That's our main goal, right? As developer relations, our goal is to make making users successful and happy on our product, project, whatever our thing is. So what does our equation look like? The probability of success or happiness or whatever you want to say is equal to some number times awareness plus some number times user experience plus some number towards ease of adoption plus some error we can control, like things that we do wrong, plus stuff that we don't control, like sales making prices too expensive or something like that. Right? That's not under our control, but we can actually et estimate something like this. You, 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 the slides will be up. You don't have to really memorize. I don't even know that this You can also change that to the number of successful or happy users. It doesn't even have to be the probability. We could just say the number of successful or happy users. The point of this, though, is this, is a, I, this one I don't think is actually pretty es very estimatable the way it's written right now. I don't think I could crank this out and estimate the numbers around this. I could with a lot of work. Um, it would take a long time. There's hierarchical modeling techniques that we could do this with. But I think the bigger question you would say to me is like, well, what do I, one, the nice part, Steve, thanks, is that we've gotten away from following individuals. Because I think that's what a lot of us get hung up on. How do I track this individual through the flow? Right? They started here. And then I lost track of them. Or I don't know how many times they saw my blog post. Or I don't know how many came to my talk. I don't have to worry about that so much anymore. Right? And the next part is we can actually do things like this, where we can take this awareness piece and break that down into something like this. Right? I can say awareness is some function of the number of blog posts I produce, the number of money, amount of money I spend on ads, the amount of social media effort I put in, some number of talks, and whatever. This is where the ARP, am I pronouncing that correctly, Phil? Okay. Thank you. Um, the ARP model can actually help, because if you look at Phil's ARP matrix, his things where he, thinks he, where he, sa oops, where he says things filter into awareness become all of these different pieces of the equation. And we as a profession, if we got good around figuring out what this number meant, we as a profession could actually get good at looking at this which is what we actually all really care about. Rather than saying, well, my transition was 10%, I still have no idea if the number of blog posts I produce, how many people in your DevRel program is, we need blog posts. You guys should be producing blog posts. Why are you not producing more blog posts? Right? That's what we hear all the time. Some of us like producing blog posts. That's great. If you're like me and you hate it, then you're like, because no we ha can't have a rational argument about it because we can't actually estimate what that number looks like. Is it wor me worth it to actually just spend more money on ads? Might we get more output if we just spent more money on ads and stopped bugging DevRel? Maybe not. Maybe it is number of blog posts. So the issues that are still left after this, though, it's still hard to get the numbers. We still have an observability problem. It's not like with my isopod, where I could go walk around the desert and go, there's a burrow, there's a burrow, take a photograph from an airplane and say, there's the amount of shrubs, there's the amount of soil, there's the amount of rock. I can't, we can't do that same kind of thing, right? Um, so we're still going to have problems estimating some of the numbers. This, this equation doesn't help, or using this framework doesn't help. A lot of success metrics, like awareness, happiness, ease of use, those things, are ill-defined by us. We actually don't have a, like if I asked everybody in here, how do you measure awareness? I would imagine I either get a lot of blank looks or we get a very disparate, disparate, disparate examples. So this, is, to me, is a good place for us to put our efforts as a profession. And I'll come back to where we should be doing as our profession in a little bit, I think. Uh, an example, oh no, there are other models we could use as well. I'm just giving you an example of another model, kind of to free up some of the constraints you had, because all you're thinking is funnel, maybe. <clears throat> other fields create models all the time. So we saw a model from product design early this morning from Aisha, right? And then we've seen the funnel model. There's a whole host of models throughout, even if you just look in statistics, one example that we could probably use a lot is survivorship functions. Right? This basically says, what is the time to an event, or what's the probability of event happening given certain things happening along the way? Right? This is what they use in drug trials all the time. If you think of survivorship instead of, for us, time until they adopt an API, time until they use a certain function in your API, you could actually say, how long does it take for them to get to this next level in our API? And you can estimate it. And then you can say, when I change things, how does that change how long it takes? But this brings up the other problem that estimating these models will take careful thought on how we do our treatments. 
Right? And so what I mean by this is, suppose we wanted to estimate this model. You, as yourself, probably only have one population that you're dealing with. Right? Just your users that you have. So you're going to have to do one of two things, which is either pick a new market, like say, let's say you're mostly North American. You can say, oh, well, we're moving into APAC. I'm going to try something different in APAC to see if, I, if I, when I do something with different with these, do I get a difference in the response rate? Or we're going to have to get better at sharing statistics somewhere along the, or sharing data along the way to estimate these models. We can have a longer discussion about this later. I'm sure you're all dying to. Um, <laughs> but I just want to point out that it's not going to be easy necessarily to parameterize. But the point of those models necessarily wasn't to parameterize anyway. It was also just to get us to think about things differently. Like with this, I'm, now I'm going to go back again. The other part with this model that's nice is I'm no longer thinking about the funnel and I'm thinking about things differently. This can actually be the sum no number of blog posts I produce over a certain time period. I'm not tracking individuals. I'm just looking at number of blog posts. Right? And so it's a different way of thinking. I don't have to go like, oh, well, I have to make sure that they make this transition to this place and I'm focusing on where they are. And I can think actually in aggregates. So it may clear up our thinking or think of different ways to deal with our stuff. All right, let's, let's bring it home. So the take homes. One, you are always making wrong models, always, which should actually be liberating because everybody else is making wrong models as well. Everybody is. There is no doubt. So when you're in an argument with somebody, right, and they say something, there is something about their model that is wrong as well, unless you're dealing in like pure math, right? Other than that, pretty or Boolean logic or something. Other than that, their model is probably wrong in one way or another. So the question is, is the model that you're actually arguing about, is it useful to, or helpful to figure out what you want to figure out? We can have other ways of thinking about our, our efforts, and we should be mining other disciplines, looking for other models to help us think about what we want to do. All right? Using analogies, doing all the other model extrapolation. As a profession, we need to start doing more formal work on this, I think. The DevRel, you could say, is about, what, 15, 20 years old right now? I think we've done quite well in establishing, our, establishing ourselves as fun. Um, I think what we really need right now in our profession is more uh, effort on professionalism. It's, we, I think it's time to self-correct, perhaps a little bit, and move into, like, if you look at the early days of software engineering, there were tons of arguments within the profession about what was the right way to evaluate productivity, right? And there was a vigorous debate about it. And I think they actually came up with, there is no right way to evaluate productivity. And that's not really the point. The point was, they had frameworks and models, and they discussed it, and they worked on it, and figured that out, rather than just keep saying, we're going to use the funnel model, and isn't that awesome? And then arguing about, well, our funnel is better than if we did this, and we produce blog posts, and we're getting better transitions or something. I think we actually need to start thinking about more about ourselves as a formal profession. And I'd really like to discuss it more, but I'm not going to do it today because it's a third rail. Um, and then let's identify common metrics and how to measure them. I'd really like to see this happen, at least. Like, what does awareness mean? Like, go through Phil's Thank you. You know, the hard part for, I don't know how many other Americans feel this, but you know, in America, we have the, United, the American Association for retired people, the AARP. So all, every time I see it, I'm like, damn it, I'm not that old yet. Right? <laughs> That's the last step in the, thank you, thank you. <laughs> where I get discounts and I eat lunch at 3 o'clock. OK, I'm breakfast, dinner at 3 o'clock. All right. Um, and the, fi the final part, and I know I talked about metrics and models, and I always bring this up, because I did it last year with the ROI thing. Um, but we can justify our existence without numbers. I would like us to stop also navel-gazing so much on numbers and justifying our existence around numbers. At the point at which DevRel justifies its existence based on numbers, we've already lost. Right? You know, the person who made the really cool iPod uh, advertisements, I bet you there was no discussion about numbers when they made that. You know, you know which one I'm talking about? Like the person dancing and there's all this, like, created a whole lifestyle feeling around the iPod and Apple and music. And, Look at the software engineers in your company. How many of them are arguing about what numbers? Bugs per line count. Anybody actually have software engineers at their company taking that seriously? No, but do we say, oh, that means we need to get rid of software engineering? 
right? The only group I've seen that's so focused on numbers because it's really easy for them because their life is all about numbers is sales, right? Just sales. Everybody else and SEO people, um, right? Because it's easy for them. Basically, we become focused on numbers where it's easy, and I don't think that works for us. As Mary's pointed out in her book, there's a lot of squishiness around what we do. We, need to be, we do need to talk about value and things we bring to the company, and we should work on formal models so that we get better at our discipline where we can in terms of numbers. But we bring value in bringing developers to our product or project irregardless of the numbers. I think we could be a bit more professional in how we present ourselves to the outside world. This is within the family. So in the video, if you're not a DevRel person, please ignore this next part of the discussion. This is an in-family discussion here. But I do think it's come time for us to actually be a bit more overcorrect a little bit towards, oh, dare I say it as I wear this shirt, stuffiness, right? Or professionalism, or committees, or blah, 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 whatever you want to put around it, and suffer that pain for a bit to get to the respect. We don't have an academic discipline to back us up, right? And usually that comes through, oh, I studied this in school. We don't have that. Anyway, that's not about the model part. So but that's my thing I would like to talk to people about after. But what I'm trying to bring home here is I think there's other models we can use. I would like us to explore the other models. I'd actually like us to start parameterizing the models. And I think by doing this, we can actually get to better understandings of how we reach out to developers. So, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.